Before we move on, are there any last questions about a John Lee? Okay, next is John Mahabua. This is it. John Lee was the first of the forest of Johns to bring the forest tradition into central Thailand and into Bangkok. He died in 1961, age 55. Um, in the early 70s, John Mahabua was also a student of John Mun printed a biography of Ajahn Mun's life. He'd gone around to the other students of Ajahn Mun and asked them questions about your t what was your time with Ajahn Mun, what did you learn from him, what did he tell you about his life experiences. Um, this book was written at the request <coughs> of a high-ranking monk in Bangkok. This shows kind of an about-face. Ajahn Lee was the first to basically convert the Bangkok hierarchy, at least the Damyut hierarchy, into being favorably disposed towards the forest tradition. Um, this Somdet I told you about, who was Somdet Mahabharata Wong, invited other senior monks to come and listen to John Lee's talks. And one of them, the monks who came, was the um, Supreme Patriarch, who he was Supreme Patriarch until 1971, and passed away. And then there was another monk who eventually became Supreme Patriarch, who was also had been a personal friend of Ajahn Mahabharata, was back from their days. The word Maha and Ajahn Mahabhu's name indicates that he's studied Pali, at least to the third level. They have nine levels of Pali exams in Thailand. Once you pass the third level, you are called a Maha, which is a means great. Although, um, and so then after reaching that third level, he went out into the forest, practiced with Ajahn Mun. Um, he is reputed to be an Arahant. And he knew Sumdet Yan, Yana Sungwara, who later became Supreme Patriarch. And Yan, Sumdet Yan would invite him into Bangkok to teach at Wat Bawan, which is the head, sort of the headquarters temple of the Damyut sect. While he was there, he introduced the king and the queen to Ajahn Mahabua. The king was very impressed with Ajahn Mahabua. Um, and this was also at a time when the roads to the northeast were being opened up. This is part of the the, you know, the, basically the fight against communists in the Northeast was cutting a lot of roads. Through. What this also meant was that the forest monasteries became easier and easier to travel to from Bangkok. So all this came to kind of came together. The, the royal interest in the forest tradition. <laughs> that's, that's us, yes. The royal interest in the forest tradition, the, the forest tradition became more available to the, to the public. The, the biography of a John Mun basically got word of a John Mun throughout the country. On top of that, <coughs> um, you started getting Dharma tours. In other words, people would load up in a bus in Bangkok and go riding out and visiting different monasteries in the Northeast and dropping off donations to the different monasteries and coming back home. In addition to the Dharma tours, there were Dharma magazines, monk magazines, with centerfold. <laughs> 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 Suitable for hanging over your altar. <laughs> no, no, they didn't have trading cards, no. Oh. So it was during this period that the forest, forest tradition became more and more known. And it was good and bad. On the one sense, a lot of people Thailand was going through a crisis at this time, as you know, the question of modernization, what's being left behind, what's being forgotten as the country modernizes. And the forest tradition gave people a sense that they could get back to the roots of their tradition, people they could really trust, you know, the real, what was really good about the Buddhist tradition, what was really good about the monkhood, was becoming more available. On the other hand, though, the fact that it was getting more popular meant that life was getting easier in the forest monasteries. And you know, more and more important people were coming to the forest monasteries, and if you wanted to ordain and be famous people, you became a forest monk. Bad news for the forest tradition. So it was a combination of pluses and minuses. Um, Ajahn Mahabhu was had, had a reputation for being very, very strict with his students, and for a long time, he had a lot, a very strong control over how many people, he, how many monks he would allow to stay in his monastery. When I ordained in 1976. 
a lot of Ajahn Man students were still alive. And then kind of one by one by one they started dying off until Ajahn Mahabha was kind of the last one standing. And for the last, oh gosh, almost twenty years of his life, he was the forest Ajahn. He kind of he was considered the, the major Ajahn of the tradition. And he began opening up his monastery to more and more monks because there are fewer and fewer alternatives for people to stay. Um, his style of teaching was a lot more open so then I'd say a John Munn and a John Lee. A John Lee never talked about his attainments to anybody. A John Munn never talked about his attainments directly. A John Mahabua would be giving Dharma talks and start talking about his own practice. And at first he refused to have these, you know, the tapes of these Dharma talks made available to people, and certainly not the transcriptions. But as with the passage of time, as so as is told by one of his students. He began to see that you know, stranger and stranger versions of the Dharma were being taught in Thailand, and he thought it would be good to have at least an alternative example. And so he found some of these teachings suddenly being made available, especially in the late 70s. In the other thing that came out in the late 70s, which I think uh, contributed to his, the, the respect that people had for him, there was a woman who was dying of cancer went to stay in his monastery for three months. And he gave her a Dharma talk almost every night of the three months. And dealing with pain, dealing with approaching death, dealing with issues that come up as you're struggling with these, these issues. And then after she went home, one of her friends who had accompanied there, her there at the monastery started transcribing all these tapes. And then they were made, made available in a set of two books. I translated a few of the talks in the collection straight from the heart. And it was they were probably the most direct teachings about you do this, then you do that, and this is what it's like when you do this, 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 this in your meditation that had been made available up to that point. Um, so what you find in, with Ajahn Mahabhu is that things that the forest Ajahns in the, in the past might speak only about to their, their own personal students were becoming more and more publicly available. Now, John Mahabhu himself says you know, there's a good side and a bad side to this. On the one hand, you know, the, the teachings are made more available to people. On the other hand, you get people who will take what they've read and can, that can influence their practice in ways that may not be right, because what works for one person may not necessarily work for another person, or the stages of one person's meditation may not be the same as another's. And yet people might try to subconsciously fit them into that pattern. The basic metaphor he would use for the practice was that you're in a fight with your defilements. And he would almost, sometimes it was all like he was personalizing the defilements. They've got their, and they've got their plans to take over your mind, and you've got to fight them off. Um, of course, their plans for taking over your mind, the reason he, he would personalize them is that because they basically are your various identities that you've had in the past. They're still kind of hanging around. You know, the times when you had, you identify with your greed in the past, that becomes kind of like a personality in your mind. The times when you identify with anger, the times you identify with lust, jealousy, fear, or whatever. Those do take on a kind of a personality. They become voices in your mind. And so they, you've got to learn how to get around them, because you've been identifying with them for so long that you've, it's like pulling out part of yourself, unless you can learn how to separate yourself. Okay, that's a defilement. This is my awareness. These are two separate things. Then you can take them on. Um, some of his more striking teachings, first his, deal, his teachings on pain, and that series of talks that he gave to the woman with cancer, he talked about his own experience with dealing with strong pain in his meditation. He would sit for many hours at a time and just wait until the pain came up, and then start, as he said, start analyzing the mind's relationship to the pain. And he, as he said, what kind of the breakthrough moment for him was when he realized the extent to which the labor you place on the pain is the problem. The pain is not so much the problem. The pain, if it's in the body, it's just, as long as it's just in the body, doesn't come into the mind, it's not a problem. But as soon as you create the label that said, this is a pain, this is my pain, this is hurting me here, um, this pain has taken over my knee, the pain has taken over my back, whatever, you've got a problem. And you've got to learn how to see the extent to which that perception is the one that's making the pain a burden on the mind. And the way you get past that is to start questioning how you visualize the pain to yourself. Now, he doesn't talk in these terms, but the way I've sort of absorbed this message is that your first encounter with pain as a child, you still had some very rudimentary ideas of what was going on in your body. And that became kind of the language with which you speak to yourself about your pains. And we've been carrying a lot of that stuff around with us. So some of the questions he would have you ask about the pain, at the surface sound kind of strange, like, you know, is the pain the same thing as the knee? 
and your rational mind will say, oh no, it's not. But then part of it, the subconscious part of the mind says, yeah, the pain is my knee. It's got my knee. It's in my knee. Right? See, it's, yes, and then you would have you question that assumption. Is the pain the same thing as the knee? Pain is one sort of phenomenon. The knee is a phenomenon of earth, water, wind, and fire. Those are two different kinds of things. And again, it's like we talked about earlier about waves of different frequency in the same spot. They may be in the same spot, but they're different frequency. There's a different quality of them. Can you separate them out? And what's the perception that causes them to clump together? It's in the course of trying to separate them out that you see what that perception is. And you see how the perception has kind of gone out of your heart and gone to the pain. And when you see, okay, when you see that in action, you say, I don't have to apply that perception. You let it go. And you'll see there will be a big difference in the mind's relationship to the pain. So he's talking about how you know, your perceptions create the bridge from, say, the physical pain into the mental pain. Um, in, his own, in his discussion of body contemplation, it's a similar sort of thing. He talks about how he had been practicing body contemplation, you know, visualizing you know, you know, everybody's body, just you know, taking the skin off, taking the flesh, and seeing what was left. So that no matter when he was, whoever he looked at, he could immediately kind of have that perception. And he got to the point where he said he wasn't feeling lost for anybody. But then the question came, he said, wait a minute, did I really get rid of lust or is I, am I just hiding it? So, cause, because I couldn't think of a moment when I saw through the lust. So okay, I've got to check this. And so I went back. For four days he tested himself by visualizing a really beautiful body right next to his and seeing how his mind was going to react. And so for, you know, for most of us we try it for a day and say, hey, lust is gone, okay. Great. He said, no, let's keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And the mind said, enough, enough, enough. And he said, enough of what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept this enough unless I know why, why the lust went. And then after the, f the fourth night he realized, okay, the lust wasn't gone, it was just hiding. And it kind of began to show itself a little bit. So okay, now what do I do? And so then he started playing with, okay, here's a body that I perceive as beautiful, this is a body I perceive as not beautiful, what's the difference? And on one level, it's, it, the answer sounds pretty simple. It was you know, the perception that he was applying to it. But then the question is, why are you applying that perception? What do you get out of applying that perception to a body, either beautiful or not beautiful? And so he examined that, again, the process of perception, the labels um, that the mind places on things. And he was able to see, again, you know, the problem is not with the body, it's all in what the mind is doing as it runs out to its object. The third teaching that is really distinctive is his is he achieved a state of mind which everything seemed radiant. The mind seemed radiant, everything he looked at seemed radiant. And his first assumption was this must be it. And then he said, so all I have to do is maintain this and this is going to eventually get in, develop into nirvana. And at, th at that one point he began to realize, hey, wait a minute, if it's something that has to be developed, this is not nirvana, this is the path. As long as I hold on to this as being the goal, I'm still falling short. And so he started taking apart his attachment to the radiance, and he began to realize, okay, when the Buddha talks about ignorance, that's what he's talking about. It's this really radiant state of mind, which is what everything comes from. And when people talk about in meditation getting to the ground of being, they get to this radiant state and say, well, that's it. He said, no, you've got to take that apart to get to something deeper. Well, it's not everybody experiences this, but the Buddha does talk about it. Um, he says there's the mental states where everything seems bright, and it's a kind of mental mastery. It's a, it's one of the skills that you can develop in concentration that some people develop. But he says it's this radiance that, in the John Mahabhu's case, that was the last thing he had to let go. And a couple of the forest of Johns who talk about it, that was their experience prior to prior to full awakening. Years back I was invited to the DPP and I was asked to give a talk in, on a sutra and so I chose Manjama 121 where the Buddha talks about going through the various stages of concentration and seeing where the disturbance is in the state and seeing, okay, it's empty of the disturbances that were in previous states but there's still this disturbance here. What happens when I let go of the perception that causes that disturbance? And finally you get to 
total emptiness, which, which we talked about earlier, total, you know, total freedom from defilement. And one of the questions after the talk was, this description of enlightenment you just kind of gave us, it sounds awfully hard. <laughs> and yesterday one of the teachers here was talking about enlightenment, enlightenments, plural, and he was saying it sounded like something that I've had many times. You know. Are you talking about the same thing? And so I told the story about Ajama Habua. You know, his experience of the radiance of the mind and, and realized well, he had to cut through that. And his comment, once he got through his attachment to the radiance of the mind, he got to something that was really pure inside. He looked back at the radiance of the mind, he said, that was a, excuse me, he said, it was a pile of shit. <laughs> and I hadn't realized that the day before that teacher had talked about the state of radiance as, you know, an enlightenment experience. You know, you know, open mouth, open mouth, insert foot, you know. <laughs> so, one of the reasons I wasn't invited back. <laughs> but as I went on to say, because he saw that that particular state of mind was so attractive and so easy to fall for, I mean, that's one of the reasons why he was so strict with the students about not falling for anything. Everything has to be questioned. So, so those are some of John Mabo's kind of more distinctive teachings. Yes. His his name came up in a forum a while ago. It's it's, it's either B U A or B O O W A, and that's just a. It's However, the person yeah. likes to. Anyway, somebody referred to him. I found this, this big, huge writing that he wrote, where he describes his attainment of the paths. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it starts with stream entry, but uh, and he goes on and on, and just very subjective, mm -hmm. but clearly knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's from talks. It's it's this huge kind of. I think what they did is they pieced that together from, from talks. talks. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's fascinating. But mm -hmm. It's very long. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. First, I should say I'm not completely sure I heard this story right, but but I, I uh, believe I did hear a story about how Ajahn Mahabua uh, uh, prohibited or denied the possibility that a, a woman in uh, who became uh, a uh, anagarka could go on to uh, take all the precepts and wear brown robes. Oh, I, so that was out. Uh, so how could how could someone who's so attained mm -hmm. have such an attitude? Well, again, it's the, it's a very strong tradition uh, respect for the Vinaya, and a lot of his experience with in the practice was having been trained by John trained by John Mun, and the idea that you know, someone can just kind of take on the robes and say, "Okay, I'm training myself." You're not going to get the same kind of training that you would get from you know someone who had actually practiced and had been trained himself and had been trained by people before him who had actually been attained. So why wouldn't he be willing to do the training? You... Bhikkhuni training and bhikkhu training are two very different kinds of things, and you can't have a woman living in you know in the monastery in the same way that you can have a monk living in the monastery where the women are. And so you have to it's you know for a bhikkhuni to be trained, she would have to be trained by a trained bhikkhuni. I mean, he did, you know, he had some eight precept nuns who are claimed to be arahants. Mechi Kao. Mechi Kao was the primary one, but there are some others who are also reputed to be extremely highly attained. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, thanks. Yes. Um, you talk about radiance of the mind, and I've heard um, various references to the mind is radiant. Mm -hmm. Are those two different things? Yes. <clears throat> well, but he, he does talk, there's, in fact, there's a passage here where he talks about how when the Buddha talks about the radiant mind, that is not the awakened mind. Ah, okay. It's the mind basically in a very strong state of concentration. Okay, so the radiant mind... Is the radiant mind? Uh, are there two different reference? Are there two different ways of talking about the radiant mind? Is radiant? 
is <laughs> okay. in, in the canon they make a distinction between radiant mind and what the Buddha calls consciousness without surface mm -hmm. and consciousness without surface is not described as radiant it's just described as totally pure and totally free mm -hmm. whereas the radiant mind it's not clear what he's referring to I mean it's an extremely short sutta whereas in the one he was talking about consciousness without surface it's obvious from what he's talking about it's beyond form it's beyond the formless so it's not a formless John, it's beyond formless John as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas the radiant one is a quality that comes in, say, the formless John is. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can come in the formless John Because mm -hmm. I've gotten, I've been quite confused by some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, the pas one of the passages we have in this, is why he's talking about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in Chinese, there's a phrase that wealth does not pass, um, does not pass down more than three generations. Mm -hmm. And earlier, you made a comment something about there's always a reform movement. It's almost like a wave. Mm -hmm. So, if Ajahn Man was the first generation, mm -hmm. and Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Li, and Ajahn Mahabua is the second, mm -hmm. are we kind of? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I like to think that coming to the West, we have an opportunity to sort of freshen things up. But we aren't. It's in Thailand. I mean, you still got some very highly attained people who are students of Ajahn Mahabua and Ajahn Chah. Um, but what's going to happen after that? It's really hard to tell. Because there is this. I was going to save this for the very last. But talking about concern for the future, I'm mean, given the fact that the forest tradition now has become very well endowed. And it's been attracting a lot of people who are not there for the practice. And back in the old days, if you studied with a John Mind, you had to find him first, which meant going into the jungle. And you never were sure that you're going to find him or not. But once you got there, okay, it was kind of like a filter. If, once you finally got to a John Mind, you figure, okay, you're serious. Whereas now all you have to do is hop in a car and zip, you know, in a couple of hours you're there at a forest monastery. Um, and in the past, there also were, there was the jungle to, you know, find new reform movements in. There's not much left. There's been a huge deforestation in Thailand. And John Lee's forecast was that the true practice was going to die out in Thailand and it was going to come here. So I like to think that we're part of that movement over here. But Tana John, I, my impression, or maybe perhaps is a misunderstanding, that in the West, or in any, actually in any culture, there's an adaptation process of the culture trying to take the take this teaching and then adapt it and change it to fit the culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the West, what is us being here in America, and I've been here most of my life, was the challenge of someone who's been raised in this culture to really learn the true teaching. Okay, um, I'm doing a book on this topic. It's called Buddhist Romanticism. I've written a couple of articles on the topic already, which is that m many of the assumptions that we bring as Westerners to spiritual life were things that were picked up from the German Romantics. It passed down to us through fields of humanistic psychology, um, the idea of perennial philosophy, even the way scholarship of religious history, the history of religions is being done. There's some Romantic assumptions in that, in that field as well. And so we tend to bring those assumptions into the practice. And it's learning how to be consciously aware of those assumptions and say, okay, I've got to learn how to question that assumption. Because what I noticed in Thailand was that even in Thailand, like in the case of a John, a John Mun and a John Lee, and even all the way up through my time there, was a the sense that the forest tradition stood over in opposition to the culture to some extent. It stood outside of the culture. But what you're seeing now, more and more, it's being sucked into the culture. But there's still a sense of, okay, the forest monks are different. And their attitudes are different. That's what keeps it kind of alive. But in every culture, you're going to have to come in. People trained as you know, what, as children, they thought they knew what the Dharma was. When they become forest monks, they have to learn how to question those assumptions. And so, what's really important is you have a teacher who's well trained, who's already been through that questioning process, that kind of help you, help you through it. I know in my case, John Fuang said, "You're going to live with me. You have to be 100 percent Thai." One. Um, the fact that you are a Westerner is not an excuse for anything. <laughs> Number two, 
you're a Westerner, your opinions are not welcome here. <laughs> For someone who thought pretty highly of his opinions, that was quite a sharp blow. You know? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I've been through that hurdle where I, you know, I did have to learn how to question a lot of my Western assumptions. And it didn't mean, mean taking on Thai assumptions all the time, but it did mean, say, learning how to step back and question things. And so what you need in a teacher is someone who's already been through that process of stepping back out of the general culture and trying to figure out, okay, what is the culture of the noble ones? How does that apply here? I have a question. I have a mic. Sorry, and I have two questions. Um, just to cap from what you were just talking about, so you've been really stressing forest tradition, hmm. not really Thai forest tradition. Well, so, of course it is Thai, but it is, again, it has questioned a lot of the values in Thai society. And looking at it from the outside, we can see in some ways, okay, certain Thai values have been retained within the tradition. But those are Thai values that they saw were still valid in light of what John Mun was teaching about the customs of the noble ones. And it appears from what you've given us today that it's really about the way you're practicing with Dhamma. Right. Above, Dhamma in line with the Dhamma. Right. Above and outside of your culture. Which goes, yeah, transcends any of the culture. Mm-hmm. So the mm-hmm. question being, will the West be able to find enough of that Be willing to Dhamma step out of being line. Westerners. So, so many people say, we're Westerners, we have to have the Dhamma designed for Westerners. And I said, no. <laughs> you have to be willing to put aside your Westernness if you're going to learn the Dharma. Because it's really not Thai either, right. or Sri Lankan, right. or Burmese. Yeah. It's the Dhamma in line yeah. with the Dhamma. When I was, after John Fuang passed away, we created a little museum of his effects. You know, we had his bowl, and we had his robe, and a few other things. And shortly after we put it together, remember some, we had it in this, there was a mausoleum at the top of the hill. You would go inside, and there was kind of an altar, and next to it was the museum which is just a little cabinet. And someone came running down one day and said, there's something on the robe. And I went up and it was this little white stuff on the robe. And my first thought was, mold. How did mold get on the robe? And everyone else was saying, no, it's not mold. His, his sweat has turned to relics. <laughs> and it did glitter. It wasn't, like a, you know, it wasn't like a regular mold. And it kind of grew for a while and then finally covered the cloth and there it was. And eventually word got out that there was this you know, diamond dust on a John Fung's robe. And one day, one afternoon, this group of people came out from Bangkok. And they were from the education ministry. And they came out and said, you've heard about the robe, can we go up and see it? And we said, sure, go ahead, it's open. So they went up, came back down. They said, have there been any other miracles ever, ever since he passed away? And they said, yeah, people driving all the way out from Bangkok to look at a piece of cloth. <laughs> <laughs> They said, no, no, that's not what we meant. <laughs> How about when he was alive? Was there any, anything that was miraculous? And I said, well, one thing that I thought was miraculous was here I was, a Westerner, living with a John Thai who was very much a Thai person. Um, and yet, in our interaction, I never had the sense that it was, that the, his Thai-ness or my Westerness was a barrier. We're human beings talking to each other. I said, I think that's pretty miraculous. They said, that's not what we meant. <laughs> <laughs> So I know, I know. So I went into the room and got some amulets for them. <laughs> they were happy. <laughs> uh, my other question, um, more detailed, um, could you say a little bit more about, you were talking about um, Ajahn Mahabua's consideration of the lust issue and coming back to just perception. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems to open a lot of um, uh, possibilities in learning mm-hmm. of just uh, like that perception is the thing that makes a lot of that going out mm-hmm. is itself kind of a, a pleasure, mm-hmm. a right. mental pleasure right. coming from some. And where is it going back to? That where is it going back, back to? What is the, again, what is the allure of creating that kind of pleasure? What is that? Why is the mind feed on that? 
Yeah. We don't feed so much on the object, that we feed on our ability to find something attractive in the object. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. Okay, what is our motivation? What is the payback that we think we're getting? Did he... Um, he didn't go into more detail He didn't than expand that. that. He didn't expand that. About any other... And you know, this, you know, you're always seeing when he, when he talks about being with a John Munn, there are a lot of times John Munn would refuse to expand. It's up to you to figure this one out. Now he does that. the passage here that I, uh, that I quoted here. There was another section of the passage where he talks about sometimes you come back and from a meditating alone, you really do have some big problems, and a John Munn would help him pass those. But questions about interpreting a Dharma talk, interpreting what he said, you've got to work on that. There was a story John Fuang told about when he was with a John uh, a John Lee, and I think I know why he told me the story because. You know, being with him on the one hand, being a Westerner with a lot of opinions, I would have had my ideas for how things could be done better in the monastery. And so I was told, no, you're not welcome. And then I said, okay, I guess n no opinions at all, just do what I'm told. And then, he was, and then I do what, he was what I was told, and he said, don't you ever think for yourself? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so one evening he took pity on me. And he told me the story about one time when he was with John Lee. They were building an ordination hall at Wadisokaram, and the original plan, as with most ordination halls in town, was that the Buddha image would be on the western side of the hall, facing east. And so when they laid the cornerstone, which was kind of where all the relics and passage of Dharma, maybe little Buddha images, were, were placed under the western side where the Buddha image was going to be. And then they built the hall. And at some point in the construction, a John Lee changed his mind. He was going to the Buddha image facing, would have the Buddha image facing west. So the Buddha image was put on the east side of the hall. Of course, people wondering, you know, why? Um, that was the hall I was ordained in. <laughs> so I like to think that was the message, Buddhism is going to go west. At any rate, when they finished the hall, um, they realized that the Buddha image was over here and the cornerstone was over here. And this was the part where people would be walking over it. Now in Thailand you don't walk over things like that. And so someone pointed this out to a John Lee one day, and he turned to a John Fung and he said, okay, tomorrow morning move it. And a John Fung's first thought was, there's no way you're going to move that, that's planted in cement. And it's all sealed up. But he also knew that if he told a John Lee, I don't think this can be done, then a John Lee said, well, I'll find somebody who has the faith to do it. <laughs> so the next morning, John Fuhrn got all the able-bodied monks and novices in the monastery down under the ordination hall, and they got ropes and crowbars and everything, tried to pull the thing over to the other side. And after a whole day of doing that, it didn't work. So that evening, he went to see a John Lee, and he said, how about we pick a new box over under the Buddha image? open the old box, take all the stuff out, and put it in the new box over here. Would that work? And John Lee said, yep. And then John Fuhrman concluded by saying, that's how you show respect for your teacher. But not only that, that's also how you take a teaching from your teacher. You take the teaching, you give it a try. If it doesn't work, you try to figure out why it doesn't work, and then you go to the teacher. You don't just come back and say, I'm having a problem, it's not working. You come back and say, this wasn't working, but I was wondering if it, this might be a solution. In other words, you show that you're putting some effort in to try and understand the problem yourself. And then he might help you along. That's how you study in the forest tradition. Any questions about Ajahn Mahabwa before we look at the, the passages? So we're going to get to you? No. Let someone else do a day long on Tanisha Robico. Okay, this passage here, it's from a Dharma talk that I recommend is really worth reading. The very first part is when he's talking about sometimes after listening to him, you'd have to take through it, he's talking about a John Munn, you'd have to take two or three days to figure out what he meant. This at least was the way things were for me. Whether or not this was the way they were for the, my fellow students, I never had the chance to find out. But as for me, I'd use all my strength to ponder anything you might say that seemed to suggest an approach to the practice. And sometimes after three days of pondering the riddle of his words, I still couldn't make heads or tails of it. I'd have to go and tell him, what you said the other day, I've been pondering it for three days and still can't understand what you meant. I don't know where to grab hold of it so I can put it to use or how much meaning your words had. He smiled a bit and said, oh? So there's someone actually pondering what I say? <laughs> so I'd answer, I'm pondering, but pondering out of stupidity, not with any intelligence. 
Then he'd respond a little by saying, well, we all have to start out by being stupid. No one has ever brought intelligence or wealth along at birth. Only after we set our mind on learning and pondering things persistently can we become intelligent and astute to the point where we can gain wealth and status, we can have other people depend on us. The same holds true with the Dharma. No one has ever been a millionaire in the Dharma or an Arhat at birth. That's all he would say. <laughs> he wouldn't disclose what the right way would be to interpret the teaching that had preoccupied me for two or three days running. It was only later that I realized why he wouldn't disclose it. If he had disclosed it, he would have been encouraging my stupidity. If we get used simply to having things handed to us ready-made from other people without producing anything with our own intelligence, then when the time comes where we're in a tight spot and can't depend on anything ready-made from other people, we're sure to go under if we can't think of a way to help ourselves. This is probably what he was thinking, which is why he wouldn't solve this sort of problem when I'd ask him. The next passage, this is one of the more moving passages in the, in the forest tradition. He talks about what it was like right after John Mon passed away. And the essence of the passage comes down at the very end. He said, next to the last paragraph, So I sat there reflecting with despair, the problems in my heart that I had once unburdened with him. With whom would I unburden them now? There was no longer anyone who could unburden and erase my problems the way he had. I was left to fend for myself. It was as if he had been a doctor who had cured my illnesses countless times, and it was the one person with whom I had entrusted my life. And now the doctor who had given me my life was gone. I'd have to become a beast of the forest, for I had no more medicine to treat my inner diseases. While I was sitting there reminiscing sadly a bit about him with love, respect, and despair, I came to a number of realizations. How would he taught me while he was still alive? Those were the points I'd have to take as my teachers. What was the point he had stressed repeatedly? Don't ever stray from your foundation, namely, what knows within the heart. Whenever the mind comes to any unusual knowledge or realizations that could become detrimental, if you aren't able to investigate your way past that sort of knowledge, then turn the mind back within itself. No matter what, no damage will be done. That was what he had taught, so I took hold of that point and continued to apply it in my own practice to the full extent of my ability. In other words, when something comes up in your meditation and you're not sure how to deal with it, just go into the sensual camp, just aware. I'm not going to brand this as true, false, or anything. Just kind of watch it. Don't be too quick to jump to conclusions about what something might mean, what something might be important or not important. Just say, okay, step back. And then it'll pass. The next passage deals with his analysis of pain. He was talking about how he was sitting one night and this huge pain came up through his body. When I couldn't find a safe spot in which to place the mind, mindfulness and discernment dug down into the pain, searching for the spot where the pain was greatest. So instead of running away from the pain, remember the Buddha's instruction with, with regard to pain is to comprehend it. And to comprehend it, you just got to start after, instead of running, you can't run away from it, you've got to turn, turn and face it. Wherever the pain was greatest, mindfulness and discernment would investigate and explore right there by ferreting out the pain to see clearly. Where does this feeling come from? Who is pained? Okay. Asking, okay, what, what's this perception you have about my being pained? Well, who is this me that's being pained by this? When they east asked part of the body, each of them remained in keeping with its nature. The skin was skin, the flesh was flesh, the tendons were tendons, and so forth. They had been that way from the day of birth, but they hadn't been painful all along from the day of birth in the same way that they had been flesh and skin from the day of birth. The pain has been arising and vanishing at intervals. It hasn't been lasting like these parts of the body. So here he is taking the perception that glommed the pain together with the solid parts of the body and separating it out. I focused on down. Each part of the body that's a physical form is a reality. Whatever is a reality stays that way. Right now, where is the feeling arising? Rising. If we say that all these things are painful, why is there one point where it's really severe? So I separated things out. At this point, mindfulness and discernment couldn't slip away anywhere else. They had to run along the areas that hurt, whirling around themselves, separating the feeling from the body, observing the body, observing the feeling, observing the mind. These three are the important principles. In other words, seeing the body is one thing, feeling is one something, the awareness of these things is something else. And then looking for what it is that connects them. That's basically the message of this passage here. Um, third full paragraph. The mind was what had labeled the feeling as being this or that. This I could see clearly. As soon as this was really clear in this way, the feeling disappeared in a flash. 
At that moment the body was simply the body in line with this reality. The feeling was simply a feeling and it disappeared in a flash into the mind. It didn't go anywhere else. As soon as the feeling disappeared in the mind, the mind knew that the pain had vanished. The pain had vanished as if it had been snapped off and thrown away. Everything gets separated out at that moment. But even that, he says, was not final awakening. And another passage when he talks about dealing with pain, he says, you know, that the strategies that worked for yesterday's pain may not work for today's pain. So you've got to figure out new ones, new questions to ask, new ways of approaching the pain. Because each, t each time the pain may be calling up or bringing up a different perception or a different defilement of one sort or another. So you've got to figure it out. Keep bringing up new approaches. The next passage goes into quite a bit of detail, and you can you read this on your own when you go back. When he talks about testing the lust. Yes. I'm trying to understand the distinction between some of the teachings, uh, like, uh, between what you're just describing, is between is that kind of like rumination, or because sometimes I feel like the teachings are more kind of left in the feet, not pay attention to the thoughts. Is it because it's specifically with relation to pain, or can you help me understand? Okay, there's, I mean, you have many different issues. Um, as the Buddha said, there are two types of pro causes of suffering, the ones that go away when you just look at them, and the others that require an exertion. And it's, it, the Buddha calls this exerting a fabrication, which means asking questions about things, changing the way you breathe, asking questions about things, looking into your perception. You know, what is the perception that I'm holding here? That requires a lot of investigation. So it's, you know, the forest tradition, I remember Ajahn Utai, who was a student, both of Ajahn Mahabua and of Ajahn Fun, was asked, he was in New York a couple years back, and pretty much this question was asked of him. And he said, what? You just look at things and they go away? No, no, no. <laughs> there are some things that will go away when you look at them, but a lot of the really difficult issues are things you have to keep asking questions about. Why does the mind keep going back? I mean, you can let go of a thought, but if it comes back again, you, you haven't really dealt with it. Right. If you, if there's, if just, you know, if it's one of those defilements that all you have to do is, oh my gosh, this is a stupid defilement. It doesn't require much investigation. But there's other things you find. Okay, it may be stupid, but it's got a pull. It's got, it still has some allure. That's why I said you have to really look into the allure to understand why is it? Why I keep going back to this? What do I think I'm getting out of it? So again, like. The idea that you can use one method that's going to work all the time. It's like being a carpenter that has only hammers. You probably know the story about when the, the British were preparing for the Japanese invasion of Singapore. The story goes that they were convinced that the Japanese were going to come by sea, and so they had all their cannons set up pointing to the sea, set in concrete, ready to fire at the Japanese. turned out the Japanese came down Malaysia. The cannons were useless. And it's the same thing with your meditator. If you have only one technique, your defilements are going to get behind the technique and get, in, you know, get you. So you have to be willing to use a variety of techniques to get the results you need. His discussion of dealing with body contemplation was a similar sort of thing, seeing that it was, okay, there's something about the mind that comes up with these perceptions of attractive and unattractive. And when you see the issue is not so much the body, it's your wanting to label things one way or the other. That's the problem. Of course, the question then comes in, what's your motivation for wanting to label those things that way? You've got to look into that. We talked earlier about the, the gratification that comes from finding something beautiful, finding something attractive. Yes?
So I assume when a person does these contemplations, they have a very good developed uh, sense of concentration. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we just ordinarily contemplate this. Mm -hmm. If you really want results, you need that concentration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, apparently, John Mahabua was practicing really strong concentration for eight years before John Munn you know, called him on it. Now, John Munn was there all the time. He could have called him on it earlier if he'd wanted to. But he saw okay, that John Mahabu's concentration had to get really, really strong if he was going to go on to the next step. Now, this doesn't mean you don't do the analysis prior to having really strong concentration. It's just that the results you're going to expect will be different. I mean, you have to do this kind of analysis on a regular basis. As your concentration gets better, your understanding of what's going on is going to get deeper. But that's one of the reasons why the Forest of John's kept emphasizing, still, make the mind still, make the mind still. Stay, in my case, it was stay with the breath all day long. And John Fuang had a nice analogy. He said, meditators are of two sorts, the people who think too much and the ones who don't think enough. <laughs> Nobody starts out just right. <laughs> and the ones who don't think enough are the ones who find it really easy to get into concentration. And those are the ones that you have to really give them a kick in order to get them to move on beyond concentration. Then the other types of people tend to like to analyze things already. And what they have to be was told, okay, go back and just be really still. And when the mind is still enough, okay, then their natural tendency to analyze things will just kick in. But you have to learn how to resist that for a while. So much of the training goes against the grain. You know. <laughs> In my case, what it meant was I had to learn how to become good at things that I wasn't naturally good at. I got through most of my earlier life to you know, focusing on the things that I was really, really good at and saying the other things don't matter. And, and sort of getting praise and that kind of stuff for that. But when I was with John Fuang, I said, look, your, your skill set is grossly lacking. And he saw me wash my robes one time. He said, Looking at you, wash your robes, make my hand and feet go so weak, you know. <laughs> How could you get this far in life and not know how to wash your wash clothes? Why don't you just throw them in the machine, you know? <laughs> so, yes. No, let's have let's have a mic. I've been thinking about the busy mind gets a bad rap, but mm -hmm. as long as it's turned towards evaluation, mm -hmm. then it's in service. Yeah, and it, and it's, the question is, are you getting good use out of your evaluation? It's learning how to do it skillfully. So, you know, John Lee talks about, you know, this is taking the busyness of the mind and putting it into good purpose. Asking yourself the right questions. And again, questions of cause and effect. If I'm getting these results from my practice, are these results satisfactory? If they're not, let me turn around and see what am I doing that's still lacking. And as long as you're right there asking things about the present moment, that's perfectly fine. And John Lee's image is of grabbing hold on a grabbing hold of a post and just running around. He says you don't get dizzy. Whereas if you try standing out in the middle of the, the yard and run around, you get dizzy really fast. I mean, you're holding on to something, you're holding on to the present moment, the breath or whatever, you've got that one issue and just stay with that issue. Okay, then you can get some, you know, figure things out. So you see a lot of this with the John Mahabu trying to figure out okay, what's, what is the issue? Why does the mind see things as attractive? Why does it see things as unattractive? What is compelling it? And this gets to that issue of you know, the mind as an active principle. It's not just on the receiving end of attractive things and unattractive things. It's going out there and trying to place these perceptions on it for whatever reason. And so you want to question, what is this whatever reason? Yeah, I guess I just have had a negative attitude towards having a busy mind, an active mm -hmm. mind, but mm -hmm. if it's turned in the appropriate way, it can actually mm -hmm. serve you quite well. Right. Mm -hmm. But as I said with, the, with the John Fu, you'd say, try to get the mind as still as you can. So that you can sense, okay, this is when the busy mind is actually helpful, and this is when it's just kind of spinning its wheels. There's a question here. We need another mic. Where's the other mic? Here's, a, here's the blue mic. Yeah. 
Suppose you ask yourself questions, but you don't have answers. You say, Let's, the answer's not ready yet. But that doesn't mean you give up on the question. Well, you shelve it for a while, but... You shelve it for a while. You, you have to remember, well, it'll come up again. It'll if come it, up again. Yeah. And, if, and if, it's, if it's an important question, you don't ask, yeah. you don't forget it. But the really useful ones, and you take your question and measure it against the Four Noble Truths. This is a question related to suffering, its cause, its cessation, or how to, how to bring the suffering to an end. Those are useful questions. I knew someone who was meditating and she would get these visions about, oh, this is what the world is all about. And I said, well, you don't need to know what the world is all about. You just need, what am I doing that's causing suffering? Is there suffering here? Where is the suffering? What is the suffering? What is it that's actually weighing the mind down? And sometimes you find it's something unexpected. Here's the passage where John Mahab was talking about the radiant mind. Bottom of page 15. The original mind means the original mind of the round in which the mind finds itself spinning around and about. Okay, this is that the radiant mind. He said, he's saying this is the source of samsara. This is not the awakened mind. As in the Buddha saying, monks, the original mind is radiant. Notice that. But because of the admixture of defilements, or because of the defilements that come passing through, it becomes darkened. The original mind here is, re refers to the origin of suppositions, or supposings, not to the origin of purity. The Buddha uses the word papasaran which means radiant. It doesn't mean pure. The way he puts it is absolutely right. There's no way you can fault it. Had he said that the original mind is pure, he could really take issue. If the mind is pure, why is it born? Those who purify their minds are never reborn. If the mind is already pure, why purify it? Right there is where you could take issue. What reason would there be to purify it? If the mind is radiant, you can purify it because its radiance is ignorance incarnate and nothing else. Meditators will see clearly for themselves the moment the mind passes from radiance to mental release. Radiance will no longer appear. Right here is the point where meditators clearly know this, and it's the point that lets them argue, because the truth is, has to be found true in the individual heart. Once a person knows, he or she can't help but speak with full assurance. So that passage on the, you know, the radiant mind, this is where he's clearly saying, okay, this is not the awakened mind. And in this passage, the next passage, he's talking about what was happening in his mind while he was in that state of radiance. He was doing walking meditation. I stood there contemplating for a moment when a kind of realization appeared. If there is a point or a center of the knower anywhere, that is the essence of becoming. In other words, this sense of what they call the puru, or awareness itself, there's a point where it's focused. That's the beginning, that's the seed of becoming. That sense of what's going to develop into an identity. And he began to realize, okay, even in the radiance, there was that point of something that you could kind of grasp around. It's like the seed in the cloud that seeds the rain. The city of becoming will coalesce around that. Actually, the word, that's what it said, and I was bewildered. Actually, the point referred to that point of the knower. If I had understood this problem in terms of the truth that appeared to warn me, things would have been able to disband right then and there. But instead of understanding, I was bewildered, because it was something I had never before known or seen. If there was a point, it would be the point of the knower. If there was a center, it would mean the center of the knower. Where was it? There in that knowing mind. Okay, This is what he's saying, this se sense of awareness itself, the, kind of the basic awareness we have. There is this tendency to focus in on a point, and you become located. It might be an object out there, it might be an object inside, but there's an object around which it's, it coalesces. So that kind of, that's why this leads to more becoming. Where's the mic? Here's the mic. But uh, isn't there just awareness without a knower? You well, you could call it just the awareness too. But if there's that sense of point, that's kind of a focal point. That's the beginning of a potential for there to be an identity. So. Um, so kind of the thrust of my practice now is awareness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and but that's not the end point then. No. Mm -hmm. That's just the vehicle. That's the vehicle. And again, you've got to see how the, that awareness will focus on something, and how it latches onto it, and why it latches onto different things. And when you're letting go, 
are you letting go just because you tell yourself to let go, or are you letting go because you really saw that there was some you know, what was causing you to hold on to begin with and realizing that this was not really worth it? I, I kind of thought that awareness was the goal. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no. It's something that you maintain, but you have to learn how to observe it. This too is an act. The idea of maintaining that awareness, that's an activity. And as you're maintaining it, okay, what are you doing? And you know, when the awareness gets brighter, what made it go brighter? When it gets not so clear, why is it not so clear? What movement happened in the mind? But can't there be awareness that you're not maintaining? You're, you, there's just awareness, and you're it, not really the, working the only, it? The, the only ma awareness that's not maintained would be the awareness of nirvana, yeah. which has nothing to do with the six senses. So as long as you've got involved with the six senses, there's something maintaining it. And this part of it is remembering, stay here with the knowing, stay with the knowing, be the knowing, be the knowing. Okay, there's an act of mindfulness there. And there's a doing in the being, let's put it that way. So with that said then, is this a place where self and not self come in, of guiding well, yeah. my practice versus just a, a practice of awareness? Okay, even it, there it there's going to be a sense of... You've got to see even that awareness is not self. It's going to be something you've got to let go of, if you're ready. Okay. But your concentration has to be really strong to let go of it properly and not just go back to old. So the confusion is, you know, when I'm saying my practice, am I already three deep in identity? Or is there always a straight shot, meaning my practice is just a practice? Come, come back and say that again. Well, it, it, it always seems to me that once I get to my practice, already there's me and mm -hmm. this practice, and mm -hmm. it's already a couple stages out, mm -hmm. and, and there needs to come back to just... A practice, and like, then you find, well, in, inside that A practice, there's, you crack that open a little bit, you go, oh, there's another me in there. So you yeah. have to keep pulling back you until have to keep, You have to keep taking these things apart, and this is okay. where the investigation comes in. Okay. okay. You can't just say, wow, that was, I'm just not thinking in terms of me or am I. Aren't, aren't I great? <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> Proof. <laughs> okay. So finally came to the realization, defilement, radiance, ease, stress, these are all suppositions, they're all anatta, not self. Okay, even the ultimate state of awareness you can get to, that's still, as long as it's something you can create, it's still a supposition, you have supposed it into being. And the question is, seeing that fact. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha recommends that you get really clear about when you're doing concentration, what are you doing? Because it's so easy when you say, get a state of an awareness that seems to embrace everything. Well, I've hit some sort of cosmic principle or some underlying principle of the mind. We turn it into a metaphysical absolute. Instead of saying, what am I doing? What's the perception that's keeping me here? You've got to see everything you're experiencing. There's an activity. It's, this is why the Buddha's basic teaching is karma. We're getting into really subtle karma here in the present moment. Maintaining the awareness, maintaining the being, maintaining the whatever. Maintaining the practice. <laughs> There's still karma going on there. And that's what you're looking for. Okay, once you realize that all these things are suppositions, that's when everything went, fell still in the mind. And it was when your know, mindfulness and discernment realized that it should be simply let go. In other words, everything. In the John, a John Munn statement, all Four Noble Truths become one, everything gets let go, even the good stuff, you know, if you're ready. So, Finally, this last passage. There was a discussion in the 1990s in the Thai newspapers, is Nirvana self or not self? Now, can you imagine the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, taking <laughs> The reason for this is there's a, there's, a, there's a cult north of Bangkok, it's called Dhammagaya. And I could get into a lot of detail about Dhammagaya, but I won't. Um, but they were saying that Nirvana is your true self, among other things. 
And some of the more traditional scholars say, wait a minute, nirvana is not yourself, it's not self. And this got into the media. And different people were you know, weighing in on the issue. And so finally someone asked Ajahn Mahabwa what, he, what his answer was to this. This is a great passage. There are discussions in the media concerning the Buddhist teachings on the issue of nibbana, so people have come to ask whether nibbana is self or not self. That's the question. Nibbana is nibbana. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to contemplate for the sake of reaching nibbana, you have to follow the path of the three characteristics. In other words, you have to contemplate stress, in constancy, not self, and self. Self is the heap where all the defilements hide out. You have to remove all senses of self before the mind can gain the release of nibbana. So nibbana is nibbana, nothing else. It can't be either self or not self, because issues of self and not self are the path we follow for the sake of nibbana. It's like climbing the stairs up to our house. The first step, the second step, all the way up to the last step of the stairs. Then we step into the house. Once you're in the house, the stairs are the stairs and the house is the house. You can't say that the stairs and the house are one and the same thing. The same holds true with self and the three characteristics. They're the stairs that lead us to the paths, fruitions, and nibbana. When you've gotten past them and let them go, the mind enters nibbana. In the same way as when you've entered the house, we have no longer concerned with the stairs. The stairs don't turn to the house, and the house doesn't turn into the stairs. The house is the house, and the stairs are the stairs. In constancy, stress, not self. These are called the three characteristics, understand? We contemplate these things for the sake of nibbana. We have to follow the path of inconstancy, stress, and not self. We've contemplated them from all angles. We let go, let go. When we reach the level of not-self in full measure, we let go of not-self. In that instance, we reach nibbana. So why would not-self be nibbana? If not-self were nibbana, then nibbana would fall under the three characteristics, understand? That's why I said that nibbana can't be anything else. As for self, that belongs to the realm of suppositions. Self is a form of clinging. So how could self be nibbana? As the Buddha said, and I won't go through the Pali, Moggaraja view the world as empty, always mindful to have removed any view about self. This way one is above and beyond death. This is how one views the world so as not to be seen by death's king. Removing views about self is part of the path, see? The Buddha has us remove views about self, so how could self be nibbana? Think things through. Think, okay, it's basically said in time. In constantly stress and not self for the path we follow to reach nibbana, our sense of self is a form of clinging. We have to contemplate self so that we can get past it. Only then will we reach nibbana. So why would nibbana be either self or not self? think things through. Nibbana has to be Nibbana. It can't be anything else. If you try to add self or not self to it, you're plastering Nibbana with urine and excrement. Yeah. That's what you're doing. <laughs> so again, he's carrying through that message from Ajahn Mun that okay, once you get to Nibbana, everything else gets put aside. Right view, wrong view, Four Noble Truths, everything gets, past, gets put aside. Any questions on that? Um, can you talk briefly about how the communities of these various teachers interacted and like how these teachers themselves interacted? You mentioned like Ajahn Fuang, your teacher, and his relationship with Ajahn Li. Mm -hmm. um, how like did those communities interact with, say, Ajahn Cha and those traditions and other um, students of Ajahn Mun? Is it pretty harmonious between them? Is it just too far away? And um. And it really varied from community to community. And there's some, some of the monks who were in really close terms, and their students tended to communicate quite a lot with one another. Others were kind of further away. I mean, remember, John Munn was wandering all around Thailand. He had students here, there, and all kinds of places. So it's not the case to say that a John Mahabu and a John Lee were with him, a John Munn, at the same time. You know, there were there were slightly different generations. The John Lee was with the John Mun up in in the north. The John Mahabu was with the John Mun when he returned to the northeast. Um, but there was a sense of communi communications among them. Now the John Cha tradition is a little bit sort of an, on and off off to one side because John Cha was one of the few people who started with the John Mun who started out as a Mahanikai monk and stayed a Mahanikai monk. Apparently, John Munn said, you know, there's no need for you to become dumb. You be a good, you know, example of the rest of the Mahanikai. And there's several reasons, I think, why he said that, but he didn't explain it, so I don't want to put any idea, you know, any words into his mouth. Um, but, you know, monks from the John Cha tradition would come to where I was in, in Riong. Um, I visited them a couple of times. 
pretty amenable. Pretty much and, amenable. And, I mean, there's the John Mahabo people did not like the way John Cha was being translated, and the John Cha people didn't like the way John Mahabo was being translated. <laughs> this is among the Westerners. And then there was crazy Tanisha Rubiko off in the south, you know, down in down in Rio, and nobody knew what he was doing. Um, but, um, but by and large, it's pretty amenable. I mean, you could be in any one branch of the forest monastery and go to another another temple within the mon within the for within the forest tradition, and be accepted as part of them. Tradition, as long as your behavior, you know, are falling in line. The different teachers would have slightly different ways of running their monasteries, and you would have to sort of learn by, op by observing how are things done here. So they'd be slightly different from one place to the next. The Korwat. The, what they call Korwat. And now has the tradition changed the rest of Thailand to see um, the Thai Tradi uh, the forest tradition is more of the mainstream of it's, the it's way to go? It's become more accepted into the mainstream in one way. In other ways, um, you know, John Mahabua, toward the end of his life, became involved in what was called the Save the Nation program. Where, you know, the, they, you know, they discovered that all the gold in the tri treasury was gone. <laughs> there was nothing to you know, underwrite, the, to underwrite the currency. This was after 1997. And so he was asked by the king to help raise money to bring into the treasury. As he was going all around Thailand, raising money for that, and you know, he was getting kind of more involved in politics, not intentionally, but politicians were objecting to this to some extent, and so there was some sense in which the Bangkok, Bangkok Highway began to be less favorably inclined toward the forest tradition during this period, and so now at the moment there's kind of a tension between the, the hierarchy again and the forest tradition. That's all I can say. Yes? Can you tell us about the Metta Forest Monastery and how it's run and how accessible it is to lay people? It's very accessible to lay people. <laughs> we have a guest house, really nice guest house, by the way. We just finished it last year. Um, basically what you do is um, lay, lay visitors are allowed to come for the first time for two weeks at MX, and you're basically participating in the life of schedule of the monastery, which we have a morning group sit at 5.30 and an evening group sit at 8. Um, there are work periods early morning, late, late afternoon, uh, one meal a day in the morning, and then the afternoon everybody's free to meditate. Most people will have places under the trees to do sitting and walking meditation individually. And then in the evening there's a Q&A session where you have any questions about what's come up in your practice. How is it run? I'm the abbot. <laughs> I run it. <laughs> Which doesn't mean everything gets done the way I want it to be done, but it means I'm, it's a, and I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to maintain the tradition as much as I can. And it's located? It's located north of Escondido in Valley Center. It's in the hills north of San Diego. You can check out our website, whatmeta.org. What meta w a t meta m e t t a dot o r g. And it's got the information for visitors. So is it a son of ordained? Yes, we have eleven monks at the moment, and about seven or eight lay people who are kind of more or less permanent residents, and then room for visitors as well. Any other questions? Yes, can we get the mic over there? Um, earlier you were talking about perceptions and why our minds find certain things to be beautiful or attractive. And you mentioned that there's gratification that comes from finding things to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. So what about the opposite? Why is it that we have, why do our minds have perceptions of unattractiveness and um, of objects or situations? Why, what, what is it? Because we're looking for what's attractive and this is not satisfying us. And so brand that, okay, this is unattractive, because you're, you're going on to find something else now. It speaks for the mind's way of saying, okay, I cannot feed off of this for the pleasure I want in finding things attractive, so I'm not going to go there, I'm going to go someplace else. It's like, you know, when a child explores the world, one of the first things it does, it puts things in its mouth.
to figure out, is this food or not food? And you develop that perception, okay, you know, the blocks are not food. Um, the soap probably is food, let's try that again. Um, that kind of thing. And then you sort of sort those perceptions out until they get more useful. But basically it's because the mind is looking for something to be attracted to. It, it stumbles across things that will not allow it to see it that way. Now sometimes, however, the mind likes to focus on things that it doesn't like. It gets some gratification out of getting angry. So it's, you're asserting your independence, you're asserting your, your power of choice. So you have to look into the perceptions that you know, why does the mind flow out to things that it doesn't like? I'm at a monastery. Does there interplay with Thai, Thailand? Um, we have, some of the monks have gone to Thailand. We have a Thai monk living with us. We've had other Thai monks with us in the past. So you're considered in the tradition Yeah, we're still solidly. part of the tradition. Yeah. Have you heard of the American forest tradition? Maybe we're part of it, I don't know. This is there is this guy named Most Venerable Bhante Sayadawji Vimaramsi mm -hmm. Mahatera. Mm -hmm. He founded the American Forest Tradition. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Hmm. There's a book on Forest Dharma, forestdharma.org, or com, I forgot whether it's .org or .com, called um, A Life of Inner Quality, A Life of Inner Worth, or A Life of Inner Quality, one of the two. And then one of the talks in there is with John Mahabua talking about the various stages um, on access to insight or also on dharmatalks.org. And John Lee's book, The Craft of the Heart, goes into the stages of awakening. Those are the two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Drop the mic. So, during our break, I got into a conversation with someone about the jhanas, mm -hmm. and they were like, those jhanas that so-and-so teaches aren't the real jhanas. These are the real jhanas. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it just brings up a question, because the more you study, the more questions there are, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> It's just like so confusing, like where to actually go and what is worthwhile studying. And, and mm -hmm. do you really feel like the jhanas are worthwhile to study? And if so, do you think Vishumegana or whatever is the real jhanas? And where do you no, think we should go for it? Vishumaga, the Mishra. oh Visuddhimaga, yeah. yeah. I, I would stay away from the I would stay away from the Visuddhimaga. I mean, they tend to have the idea that. When you're in jhana, you have no sense of the world outside at all. You're totally blacked out. I wrote an article, it's called um, Silence Isn't Mandatory. You can find it on dhammatalks.org. Where I go into what the canon has to say about states in which okay, you're, the senses fall away and states in which the senses don't fall away. Um, and the whole thing about getting the mind into jhana is that you are able to see what the mind is doing. It's like what John Lee said, you're putting it into a state of becoming from which you can observe how becoming happens. And so if you're in a state of concentration where you can do that, okay, it doesn't matter who calls it jhana, who doesn't call it jhana, you make use of that ability to say, okay, what am I doing? What am I holding on to here? Is there still some disturbance in the mind that I'm causing through my perception, how do I change my perception? And you know, when you're fully in a state of concentration, you can't ask those questions. We pull out a little bit, then kind of do a little bit more directed thought and evaluation around the state that you're in. You can start seeing, okay, this is what I'm doing. How about if I drop that? Now, if the concentration allows you to do that, it's good concentration. Now, whether it's the fifth jhana or the fifteenth jhana or whatever, it's you know, you're, it's your concentration and you're gaining the insight. You can see that you're letting go of things that you used to hold on to, or you're seeing things you didn't see before. It's all to the good. They say there's one dharma, mm -hmm. but when you study Zen, it's like the opposite of this. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like letting go of trying and mm 
-hmm. just being with it and and then there's of course there's yoga and they would say that the watcher is the goal Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. that's yourself which is the opposite of what you're saying right I wouldn't say there's one Dharma. There are lots of Dharmas. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, the, the, the Buddha made an interesting comment one time. He says, you know, the, the true Dharma lasts as true Dharma as long as there are no other forms of Dharma around. Once that other forms of Dharma come around, then everything gets called into question. He says, it's the same as when, okay, when there's no counterfeit money anywhere, everybody trusts money. But when you start knowing that there's counterfeit available, then the question is, is this genuine, is this not? And then everything gets questioned. And he says, we live in the period, and the way he described this, we now live in a period where the concept of the true Dharma doesn't have the force that it used to have. This means that we've got to be more and more careful about when you're choosing a particular path of practice. You look at the people, you look at the teaching, which seems to be the most reliable one out there. And when you're choosing something, you have to look at your own motivation. Why am I choosing this as opposed to that? Is it because this is easier? Or do I think this is actually going to get me someplace? So it keeps throwing us back on ourselves. What is our motivation in looking for the Dharma? We have to, the Buddha gives instructions on how you gauge teachers, gives you instructions on how you gauge yourself. Um, keeps throwing you back on how honest am I with myself about what I'm wanting to get out of the practice and what I'm willing to put into the practice? So no, it's not. There's not just one dharma. There are lots of dharmas out there, and sadly, we live in a, in a time when it's we have to sort these things out a lot more carefully and question ourselves a lot more rigorously. Shall we end on that note? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>